I would like to thank BCA for giving us this opportunity to share our information on computational BIM using our uh, ecosystem at Graphisoft to share with the users and the industry. Mm -hmm. Few housekeeping rules before we start. This webinar will be recorded and the recording has already been started. Please look for the microphone icon to mute yourself. If you wish to speak or if you have any queries, please use the chat window to write in or unmute yourself to ask your questions during the Q&A session. We, we already had three previous sessions on computational BIM, where we have already addressed various innovative ideas for digital delivery using computational BIM right from design to construction stage. And today we will have another interesting session on digital asset delivery and facility management. So stay tuned. If, in, in case you have missed your previous sessions, you can watch the recording on our GS Learn portal under webinars. In case you are an existing Graphisoft uh, user, RTCAD user, you can use your GS ID and log on to our GS Learn portal to view the recordings under the webinars session. Or you can also log on to our YouTube channel for both the QR codes are on your screen. And if in case you want to feel, feel free to just scan the QR codes and uh, go through the recordings later. For this session, we had a rigorous brainstorming in, within our team to come up with brilliant ideas to share with you all for today's session. There were a total of nine number of ideas and we will be sharing three out of those today. But keep an eye, the rest will be coming up as blogs or videos on our social media platforms. So the three ideas that we are going to present today are controlling devices via BIMX, or disking, disking facility with RTCAD and BIMX, and digital twin updating BIM model dynamically. Let me take you through the agenda today. For today's session, I'm Reema Chopra, and I will be taking you through. And I will also be sharing with you the modeling strategy for facility asset management. After me will be Jorge Benitez from Enzyme, and he will be sharing an architect's perspective for digital facility and asset management. Followed by Mr. Chidham, who will be sharing BIMX for smart home device control. After him will be my colleague Wimmel, and he will share his idea about BIMX for hot desking. We will then have 15 minutes break. And towards the end, we will have an interesting session by my colleagues Carlo and Ralph, and they will be presenting on digital twin updating the model dynamically. Let me introduce Graphisoft to you in case you're still not familiar. We were founded in Hungary in 1982, and our flagship product, RPCAT, came into the picture in 1984. In 2007, we were taken over by the metric group. We have presence in 108 countries, and we have 85 distributors across the globe and 11 subsidiaries. As I mentioned, we were taken over by Nanatra Group, and there are a few other sister concerns as well who are under the same umbrella. So you might, might be familiar or must be using a few of them. For example, let's say All Plan, Vector Works, Blue Beams, and so on. Mm -hmm. Nanatra is currently present at 67 locations and was founded in 1963. And along with Graphisoft, Nanatra is also one of the biggest supporters for Open BIM. Let's get familiar with Graphisoft solution ecosystem. At this point, I would also like to emphasize that Graphisoft provides a solid and robust ecosystem to prepare your models for facility management. But we do not have a platform to enable facility management for your project. But you can use our tools like RPCAT, BIM Cloud, or BIMX to add in all the required information to develop the model to an extent for asset information modeling and 
use Vimex to use that information further for automation. I have a short video here from BIM aim to understand and emphasize the importance of digital twin and using BIMEX to its fullest possible capabilities for digitalization of facilities. So let me display, uh, let me just play this video for you. Yes, yeah, so as, as I'm sure that the video would have given you an, a synopsis about how you would 
use your um, BIM models further for automation and uh, control your facilities and your assets inside the building. So moving forward, let me just brief you on and take you through the BIM modeling strategy for facility and asset management. So what we will be looking at currently is evolution of BIM data to various stages of the project, asset information model, and a focused approach for asset information modeling. And then finally, digital delivery using graphics of ecosystem. So as you know that the information is going to flow from one stage to the other throughout the life cycle of, uh, of any of the construction projects. And not necessarily all information will be required at all the stages. So when the information flows, we also have to uh, be aware of the requirement of our BIM models at each and every stage of the project. As far as the assets are concerned, when the information progresses, it develops even further. We here at Graphisoft, we have products like Apicad, BIM Cloud, and BIMX to take care of the information inside the model. Now, this asset information model that we are looking at, it can be consisted of two different type of information, one in form of BIM deliverables and the other one in form of non-BIM deliverables. So your BIM deliverables will be your architectural model, your structural model, or your services model. Whereas your non-BIM deliverable information is going to be the is in form of Google Sheets, EDFs, JPEGs, XLS, and so on. As you will notice in the further presentations where I, my colleague, will be using Google Sheets to do their necessary documentation and bringing in the necessary information. Now let's talk about the focused approach. So those of you who are, have visited our office must be very familiar with this building here. And we are located at Gateway East Level 10. So in case I need to take care of the facility management for this area here, I need to be sure about the model for that particular area. So I will be developing the model for that area and will be inculcating and adding in information for that particular space and for the assets inside that space. And this data will be in form of the physical data, physical asset data, location and spatial data, performance data, and condition data. So the workflow is very quite, it's quite straightforward. We need to identify the space required for maintenance, detail out only the required space for AIM, which is your asset information model, and add required information as BIM, non-BIM data. As I mentioned that Archicad allows you to generate your BIM model and add in as much information as you would want to, to bring it inside BIMX in forms of layout plans, sections, elevations, and so on. And this information can then be used for digital handover. This information, the requirement also will be flowing in from the consultants, manufacturers, and owners. And once you publish your model, it comes as a package inside BIMX, and this information can be further used to share with the same stakeholders. As you use BIMX and you select any of the element, each and every information that you've added in the model will be on your screen to use it further for automation. In case you are interested in knowing more about the asset information delivery, you can look into the Cornet website and they ha we have the BCA BIM guide for asset information delivery there. And you can go through this. And most of the information for today's presentation was also captured from there. On this note, I would like to invite Mr. Jorge Benitez to share the architect's perspective on computational game workflows. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Graphisoft, uh, Chidam, Rima, and Tim for inviting me here today. I'm very happy to and very excited to, to share some of the findings that that uh, we've put together to introduce this uh, amazing set of presentations. So some of you may know me already. My name is Jorge Benitez. Um, I am a Spanish architect, uh, and I'm the co-founder of a company called Enzyme APD, and we are architects. Um, we are uh, architects, designers, um, but we're also 
digital consultants and BIM and technology advocates. So we are very interested in implementing the technology into the design process. That's that's our motto. Um, as and as I said, we set out the this company with the idea of of uh, integrating a good design with efficiency, innovation, and technology. So that's that uh, that was kind of like our our idea. We have a small team, very young. Uh, quite young and, and small team that we are um, um, distributed across uh, across several countries. We have an office, main offices in Hong Kong, and we have a, a offices in Ho Chi Minh City in Singapore and Madrid, where we have uh, several projects. And we've been super lucky to work with uh, 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 a list of clients and, and partners that have enabled us to to do pretty impressive projects and work in, in quite impressive projects. Um, so Archicad is our weapon, is our main tool, and it's a platform that enables us to connect with many other technologies uh, where, you know, we, where we always bring back our uh, geometry or data into, into Archicad, and it really serves as well to, to work in, in our projects. Um, so, but together with Archicad, we work with uh, a number of other tools. Um, the the main ones are Rhino, Grasshopper, and Solibri that complement Archicad very well in the modeling uh, part, in the data and analysis, and in the coordination and uh, quality control and, and collaboration. And and we have integrated, uh, or we're using some integrated solutions together with Archicad. Um, for visualization, uh, of course, Dimex, Twinmotion, uh, but we're also moving into the also the gaming platforms like Unreal. And uh, in terms of environmental tools and optimization tools, we we're using a, a number of solutions that are coming from the Grasshopper ecosystem as well as the uh, the, the Graphisoft Eco Designer Star. That is a great tool for environmental um, analysis. And, but we are we're great believers on the open beam workflow so we always collaborate with other consultants co uh, colleagues or partners that work with different software solutions and we always happily integrate all their uh, models and information into into our process by this using this this workflow of the open beam and and just as an introduction to to our methodology we don't believe that beam it's a system or it's a methodology that has to be used in one specific type of projects or one scale. BIM is a methodology that helps in every single type of project in different aspects. And the, the benefits can be seen in, in all ends of this design spectrum. So this is at least our experience and we have proven it right in urban design projects, very large scale uh, urban design projects, architectural projects, um, competitions, uh, cultural or residential projects, as well as interior design, very detailed, very detailed uh, interior design projects where we've been using them for the benefit of of our clients and and, and ourselves. So we're very happy to to say that for us, Archicad is is a tool that helps in in any type of project at any scale at any given moment. And this is our idea. We use them from the very beginning, from the design of the project until until the end. So, so this is how we can really leverage the power of uh, the computational design, the power of information, and the power of the graphical power as well of uh, using 3D models. Uh, so for today, um, I've put together this presentation to help uh, set up the tone for the other uh, for the rest of the of the presentations. So I want to just briefly discuss the the role of the ISO 19650 and all these new uh, kind of like industrial revolution 4.0, 5.0 set of uh, things that are happening, uh, how that is affecting the office space planning through the use of internet of things or, or other technologies, especially for facility management and operation, and how that also integrates with, uh, from the client's perspective, into the use of uh, technology in smart homes, domotic, uh, and of course, that will, you know, all of these home, smart homes together will form a smart city and how that also fits into the, into the picture. So the new ISO 900, 19650, it's about information management 
and it's about the data flow of information in a in a project from the early stages even pre-design stages into the uh, construction management use and even the commission so so it's setting up this uh, basis and of, of processes uh, for to have a correct information flow during the whole life life cycle right um, so in my opinion this uh, this framework that is establishing um, and is trying to standardize across countries and across um, companies and across projects is establishing a, as I said a framework uh, that will uh, enable the building to incorporate information uh, and, and intelligence in other phases of the, uh, of the usage of the of the building so during the operation phase uh, a lot of information is going to be produced via uh, occupancy or via sensors uh, IOT or, or domotic um, uh, domotic uh, appliances inside the building and all that information has to be somehow gathered somehow um, put together into a place in order to have uh, this intelligence for, for to improving the, the the performance of the building. So, um, in in this sense, um, BIM uh, enables the creation of this uh, this platform, right? Uh, this the virtual representation of an asset. So we have a BIM, a PIM, a project information model, or BIM uh, in the design phase, construction phase, and that all that information and that geometry and, and that platform. It's uh, it's enabling later on the creation or the use of this digital twin. We don't need a BIM model to have a digital twin, but it really helps because it, it's already establishing like a framework of information where we can later on plug information coming from from other uh, other sources, and we can use that information and make you make use of that information through machine learning, through pre predictive maintenance through uh, real-time operations that they, data that we're collecting and and that is really helping uh, the facility managers or or even like the owners if it's uh, just a home to to improve the the livability of the building and to improve the the maintenance of the building so in all this process as i said in so this is the uk uk bim adoption uh one diagram at the moment we are uh using the bim level two so this is the the level of adoption and maturity of bim uh, and you can see how the different different um uh, discipline models uh, are meant to be put together federated into a single model that is used as uh as a source of, of uh, one source of one source of truth and of information to take uh, quantities to take uh, information out etc but that's that's kind of like the the current state of the industry now um what we're trying to or what the, the uk is planning to implement in the near future perhaps in five or 20 years it's the incorporation in this single shared collaborative model the incorporation of other type of data that are not necessarily coming from the architects or or even from the contractors or 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 in the design stage but it's it's plugging in information from big data in from internet of things from analytics um and then it's using from if it's using information from the blockchain from 3d printing so it's really integrating all these processes new processes into a much more smarter um, uh, model that that integrates all that information of course as i said these digital twins or this shared model collaborative models become digital twins then together with other other buildings will become smart cities later and and we're going to discuss that in a minute so all this comes in the uh, in in this framework of the industrial revolution right so just I prepare a little diagram here to to um, show you about because it's really interesting as well about how we've been evolving uh, slowly through, uh, from the 18th 19th century uh, where the in Europe and North America where uh, the, the first industrial revolution was uh, started that changed the the human power and the horsepower for steam steam engines then in the second industrial revolution uh we had uh 
the steel, oil, electricity, and combustion engines that replace the, the steam engines. And that, that set uh, a really big step forward. Our third um, industrial revolution we have lifted, most of us, and it was the digital revolution that, uh, that featured the personal computers and the creation of the internet. And that really set the, you know, the, the, this, um, this base for all the other uh, industrial revolutions that, are, that came along. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, it was the, in, the, in the 21st century, so uh, we are living it now. And it features the advance of the, of the artificial intelligence, the big data, robotics, Internet of Things, blockchain, and crypto. That has happened already. And, and we are integrating that into what it's been called the fifth industrial revolution, and that it's about personalization. So all these technologies are already there, but the fifth industrial revolution is talking about how to start breaking the frontier of the, uh, of the, um, the digital and integrate the human and integrate the person on it. So um, it's more uh, geared towards purpose, inclusivity, uh, of course, using all these uh, high, uh, high technologies or high-end technologies that we have discussed in the past. But it's, you have to keep in mind that it's about making things personal, making uh, personalized for the user, right? So this is a, a really a non-exhaustive list of some of the things that are happening and changes that are becoming a commonplace in, in this industrial revolution that we're talking about. So uh, many people will be wo working from home or working from anywhere. So this, this was happening before COVID. With COVID, it, it has just exploded. The, the amount of people that are not going to the office, they are working from different places. And that requires a technology, uh, both from in home and in the office. And that is uh, creating changes in the workplace and in, in at home. Uh, a lot of manual administration will be performed by machines. So, so really a non-important task that, that can be automated will be automated. Then we're integrating these technologies as well in healthcare and in order to uh, to lead into a healthier, longer living population. So we're, this is what Steve Jobs used to say that the, the new um, the, the new the new breakthroughs will come in the intersection of the biology and the technology. So in the past they happen between the art and technology, and that's how he says that uh, where Apple sort of appear and the new breakthroughs will come in this uh, this intersection of biology and and healthcare and technology so so we're really becoming uh, bionic humans <laughs> at some point um, then later we have this 3d printing and other digital fabrication technologies that, that are becoming more and more prevalent and not only in construction but also in medicine and uh, in, in uh, new food technologies that are creating 3D printed uh, foods and, and uh, like meat or, or other things, or even like chocolate. Um, so really we're, we are um, seeing an improvement and an explosion on the different uh, fabrication technologies. And then a lot of these automations and, and artificial intelligent chatbots that will become just a routine part of customer experience in many, many fields. So now um, we use them mainly for uh, help desk and for um, client support, but then it will become part of the everyday life. So that, uh, that is obviously affecting the way the construction industry is, uh, is evolving finally. So after a very, a very low uh, speed on implementation of this, these technologies, seems that the, the construction industry is picking up uh quite quite speedy in in all these um all these technologies so we have been seeing in the last presentations uh, in this uh that Prima mentioned before uh some of them so for example the use of prefabrication and modular construction uh or or the use of, of, of 3d printing and advanced building materials uh using big data and predictive predictive analysis for construction for managing the site uh autonomous construction uh, machines like drones or or other intelligent uh, vehicles, uh, robots, for example, for uh, for also uh, checking the quality of the of the construction site, 
uh, the use of augmented reality and virtualization uh, on site and also as training uh, off site for the for the construction team and other other many other technologies that really in, integrate and and come together firstly in the form of a digital model that we uh, in architecture or, or in construction we uh, call BIM, so I've been a building information model. So that's kind of like the starting point. So our BIM models are giving us uh, this full visibility and understanding of the facility, the use and the maintenance. Of course, pr prior to construction, we can have this full visibility on the cost, on the, on the um, performance, uh, uh, environmental performance and structural performance and, and, and other other metrics, but then when we move into operations phase, we can make use of all this information that has been created into uh, in all the, 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 the previous processes and make them available for uh, a smarter operation. So really, our BIM model, it's an enabler for this, you know, for AI and other information technologies that will make use of all of that, all that data in the structure of our BIM model, that is how it is uh, organized, um, uh, especially after the ISO in this, in using ISC. So it's organized in a way that we can make use of all that data uh, without any uh, any loss or or maintaining that data as well for the whole life cycle. So a few um, a few case studies that I've gathered here on how you know, important companies and different people are using this, this building technologies really to, to, for facility management and for space planning and, and for maintenance. Uh, and, and prior to, to move to those case studies, just one, uh, one idea that I wanted to share is that really it's on the facility management, on the operation phase where using these smart technologies can really make a big difference on the cost uh, of the of the building in the whole life cycle, so we can use these technologies and collect data that it will be valuable uh, to manage better the people, the energy, to predict performance and maintenance, and to improve the performance of our buildings. Um, it's very famous this diagram uh, from um, I think it was a show uh, in uh, McLeany. Um, can't remember his name. Um, it's saying that. Every dollar that we spend in design and will become $20 uh, in the building assembly, so in the construction area. And those $20 will become $60 during the building operation. So, so these are the proportions uh, on how are we spending the money. Uh, so during the, the whole life cycle, we have 60, uh, well, like 60 times more money spent in the operation that in the design so if we are using all these building technologies for design and for assembly we need to ma uh, make sure that this also these building technologies this, this information technologies also permeate and come into the into the facility management and the operation phase because this is where the big money and the big savings are so a few ideas as well on how how can we uh, or what what benefits can we see using these building technologies uh, for example, uh, in terms of operational uh, maintenance, we can um, uh, we can definitely uh, make make use of this for um, keep the building, for example, and all the property asset at efficient levels. We can coordinate and 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 select vendors supp uh, and supplier contracts, so we can keep uh, in a in a in a very structured way, all the supplier contracts and all the um, uh, warranties for, for the element, and, and we have full control of that. Uh, we can also, for example, use um, uh, all these technologies for communication and help desk, making sure that there is an open and efficient communication between the users and the building and then and the staff. And also, these frameworks of technology will help the adoption and integration of future technology solutions that may come later uh, into, into place. Uh, of course, it can help as well uh, to execute audits and, and implement measures to ensure that the risk of the, uh, of the facility is reduced um, and, and manage the security of the building as well. And 
to, in my opinion, the most important part, uh, we can also drive the sustainability, improving the energy consumption, the water consumption, the waste management, and other metrics that can really help making buildings a better place. And that's actually one of the, one of the goals for uh, many of the governments uh, nowadays that are pushing for our buildings to become net zero carbon in operational energy. So it's it's really key, it's a key aspect to be able to to control all that information. So a few of the of examples of, for this is the Deloitte headquarters in Amsterdam. It's well it's been named one of the most sustainable and smartest buildings in the world. And their FM system uh, can track pretty much everything as you can read there. But uh, one of the interesting things that they can do is, for example, they can track the number of people because the FM, the FM system is linked into the, or, or every, sorry, there is application on the mobile phones and, and, uh, uh, and NFC uh, cards that, the, that the, the users have. And all of that is plugged into the system so that the building is smart enough to understand where the people is moving. All of that, all of that is anonymous data. But it's able, for example, to close certain areas of the building that are not in use, and that will help cutting the uh, the cost of heating, of cooling, uh, or uh, lighting, and even cleaning of those areas. So, so this is one of the things that that they can do. Uh, other things, other uh, sensors that are embedded in the in the fabric of the building, uh, for example, can di direct. And this is why it's interesting as well that, for example, mobile phones are linked of the users are linked into the system, uh, they can receive the instructions, for example, on which uh, meeting rooms are empty uh, or if there are ca cars available or, or things like that. So via their, mo their mobile app. Um, then, for example, when one of the users enter a room, the room uh, will be smart enough to uh, using machine learning and using uh, uh, historical data for, from that person will be able to set the temperature, the humidity, the lighting, the UV light, the noise levels, etc., to the preference of that individual, right? So this is really interesting how this building really uh, breathes and uh, and 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 moves almost with with the people inside, right? Um, so. Um, Another case study that is very, very interesting is the use of sensors in WeWork. So WeWork um, uh, acquired a design techno and technology company called Case, uh, like maybe five or six years ago. And Case were specialized in the use of building of this information technology sensor integration of smart technologies in, in buildings. So what they did when they joined WeWork is they established a number of um, of these, uh, of, of the most important WeWork offices, and they created um, an, a facility management system that will track certain things in the, in the use of the space. And these sensors were, um, for example, were tracing environmental uh, aspects like the light, humidity, temperature, uh, pressure, air quality, ambient light, and on the other hand, this, these sensors will also um, understand, similarly to the other building, how the different spaces, working spaces, breakout spaces, uh, meeting rooms, etc., they were used, and they were, and by how many people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So at some point, you will get a dashboard with all this information cross-referenced, and they can with with all this information the, the important thing is that they uh, are able to understand how well uh, the different spaces are used they can have a very um, important insights about how the different imagine for example they have a number of large meeting rooms but they discover that uh, the average of the use of those meeting rooms were two people so that will give them enough information to for especially this type of companies that have recurrent projects that they have a, a number of projects where they can learn from. Um, they realized that they had too many of these rooms were oversized because only two people or three people will use and they had planned for maybe eight or ten people. So they will apply all this intelligence and, and insights to the next designs, right? So in terms of the architects in the long run, what we're going to have, um, all the data that we can 
gather from this post occupancy um, really is not really capturing how people use the space now but understanding how well or how bad our design works and how people uh, will work in the future so we can understand for example these kind of trends uh, as i said now with covid it's very important to understand because we don't know how it's going to be we don't know exactly how uh, we're going to need to design our new homes and new offices now it's a little bit unclear so understanding that getting all this data all this information is very very important um, in terms of the technology the iot so there was a, a quote in 2016, so this quote is from 2016, that predicted that in 2020, there will be approximately 50 billion objects plugged into this uh, IoT network. So uh, I checked and, and now we are in around 46 billion, so we didn't hit quite yet the 50 billion, if, uh, if my sources, sources are correct, but we are getting there and it's very impressive how this, is, this uh, network and this um, market is also growing, it's, it's providing opportunities. Uh, the term IoT it was coined, it was first mentioned in, uh, in a conference, in a presentation in 2009 by the research uh, fellow from SAP, the company, Stefan Haller. And he defined this Internet of Things as a world of physical objects are seamlessly integrated into this information network. And these physical objects will become active participants in business processes. So um, he was looking into the business part, but we realized that how also uh, very small things like this iWatch or smart smartphones, etc., are becoming like a essential part of our everyday lives, right? Um, so imagine if we had computers that are that knew, that knew everything, that uh, how we're using things, how we uh, how we're living our lives, then we wouldn't need to track uh, or manually track input this data, but we can just gather this data uh, and by counting everything we do, we can understand how we spend the time, how we spend our money, how we spend our energy, and therefore optimize and reduce uh, waste, loss, and cost. So it's a uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sold on this idea of tracking everything. Some people hate this idea, some people love it, but definitely understanding uh, how we live our life, it really gives us the opportunity of changing or improving. So on one hand, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, interesting. So uh, some of these benefits of using these smart home technologies, uh, obviously uh, for a homeowner, we can boost this operational efficiency, right? And, 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 and and tweak the, the functioning of our home uh, just by gathering this real-time data. So sensors, uh, you know, we can drive home and we can check whether our home is, is too hot or too cold and we can tweak it. So uh, when we get there, it's at the optimal, ex uh, optimal temperature. That's improving the user experience for sure and the comfort, but also it's uh, reducing, for example, the energy waste uh, by uh, making sure that we are using the optimal level of energy for that level of comfort. So, so we're really, it's creating a, a, a framework where comfort, uh, energy savings, and operational efficiency are kind of like bound together. Uh, in terms of, uh, for example, uh, architectural elements like building facades or lighting or things like this, uh, or, or, or water, and we can really improve the functioning of, of that. For example, in this building, this is the uh, Al Bahar Towers in, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, they have designed this, this smart uh, out, uh, outside skin that it's reading the values of the, of the sun, uh, the sun exposure, and it's in, in a dynamic way, it's controlling the amount of light and the amount of, of, of sun that is is heating the facade so uh, it's able to reduce the cost of the air conditioning by 30 percent so uh, these kind of things can be plugged into one uh, smart central system that obviously can help monitoring like the temperature the water usage uh, or even like things like window shades uh, lights things like this to to have like a overall um complete control and, and, and full experience of, of this smart home system. And for sure, uh, plugging in the home entertainment. So when we walk into our into our home after a hard day of work, then 
the you know our favorite song uh, plays or maybe we get the news with the uh, latest uh, trends on the i don't know on the financial markets things like this so so our home can uh, learn from us and and you know display everything that we want and we need so this is an idea obviously all these concepts apply as well into a smart city scale um, so this is just a, a reminder there is like this uh, 17 sustainable development goals from the UN. Uh, some of them are pretty uh, are very focused on our our cities and how we how we live our cities, especially the number 11. Um, so, in, in Ensign, we have working on a few projects in the in the past five years uh, regarding smart cities, like this concept of a smart eco city in China together with Takenaka, uh, and things like. You know, similarly to how we were um, tackling the um, efficiency at in the smart homes, uh, we have a similar a set of, of tools or set of uh, ideas that we explore in, in the smart city concept. Like, the, of course, the energy management is one of the most important things. Air pollution monitoring, so we can understand um, the quality of the air and, and manage it. Uh, the smart waste management, fleet management, Water management, water is going to be a big problem, especially in some countries. Uh, smart farming and food production and cold chain monitoring. So these are a few things that, that are uh, linked together. So obviously this list can grow and, and uh, we can make smart pretty much anything, right? Um, these are a few other examples from uh, these smart city concepts that we have been working on in the past years. Uh, Kuala Lumpur, Finland. So everywhere in the world that are appearing this idea of how can we make our cities smarter, cleaner, more ecological, etc. All of this obviously is um, uh, is possible because of these new technologies in the, in network. So now uh, we're we're we've been rolling out in most of the countries the 5G technologies, and these 5G technologies are are helping all these sensors and all these uh, network of objects, smart objects, smart wearables, smart appliances to be all connected together into a big, big network uh, that um, that goes from our homes to manufacturing plants, traffic industry, so everything can be sort of like linked and understood in the bigger picture. Um, Singapore obviously is one of the leading places regarding smart cities. Uh, doing a bit of research, uh, I, last year found out that there is this amazing concept for a smart city in uh, Tenga uh, that I'm not sure how, how developed is this now, but that seems that uh, the, the Singapore government are, are putting a lot of um, effort in, into this, into exploring this and, and, and creating this, um, this amazing livable cities. And just to say a few nice things about Singapore. So Singapore is, is the second place in the world for green buildings. Uh, this was 2016, so this might have, have changed a bit. Maybe Singapore is our number one. Uh, but, uh, but it features more than 3,000 green buildings that have by June 2017. So it's pretty much one third of the Singapore buildings are green buildings so it's it's very very impressive and 80 cities around the world are using the singapore's green mark label to uh in, in their own countries so you can see that uh well singapore's target is that in 2030 it will have 80 percent of their building uh building park have to be green and they are put, they're putting the money and they're putting the, the big effort into, the, into doing this. And it's the most ambitious target of this kind in the world for a country. So uh, it's very impressive. So things that we can feature, we can see uh, that happen in a, in a smart city concept is, uh, well, like things like smart carbon emission management or uh, smart traffic. So, this is something that we can um, we can really really improve. That is also very linked to the carbon emission management, uh, circulation system, water management, etc. 
now with the climate change we're also having a lot of problems with floodings in many cities with um, uh, droughts as well so understanding uh, and monitoring all these in real time it's very important for for keeping our, our cities safe clean and, and livable so this is uh, all for me um, thank you very much i hope i i said a little bit the tone and, and the idea was to really inspire inspire you with with these new ideas and now i will i will pass the mic to uh, mr chidan baram and uh, that will start showing the real stuff <laughs> thanks thanks uh, Jorge. it's uh, really great and uh, you set a platform clearly for us so let me share my screen thanks uh, Rima and thanks uh, Orge for uh, giving us a very good platform. So uh, thanks also for uh, the participants. I see a lot of known faces here joining us. Thanks for your full support and uh, also people uh, from all over the world I see joining here. Thank you very much for that as well. And uh, I would like to thank Fong from BCA for uh, organizing uh, this computational team for uh, construction industry right so now we are presenting on the digital fm and am and uh, i'll be sharing uh vmax for smart home device control uh or he already have give us a big uh, overview of like uh how we can actually uh connect beam to different aspects like iot and to the smart devices right so you can uh, you have saw, saw those things but i will be focusing on a small part of it so how you can actually uh, connect that right so just give me a minute let me switch to the next screen so my agenda is actually to cover two options one is actually using a complete uh, diy uh, solution using the esp32 uh, development board and the other one is uh, off the shelf you can actually buy from anywhere uh, Lazada or anything like you can actually create a, a immediately you can connect and then work on it so these two options I'm going to present for you today All right so before going into the actual presentation I want to put up a precaution uh, you need to be a certified electrician or you need to have somebody who is a certified electrician to do this work so I'm not playing with the actual electricity so I don't want to get into any problem Buy my house or whatever right so i didn't touch the actual electrical stuff but uh i was just doing it as like a pet uh project with a very low voltage yeah so that's a precaution you have to take okay so let me show you what is the concept so how it works right so let me play a short video here So you can see here on the left, you have BMAX. I'm just navigating through the building and I'm going into the place where I want and I'm selecting the light. So once I select the light, I can go to the context menu. So there is a switch for me where I can log in with the credentials. So once I log in, I see a web page with the control for the light switch, right? So I can just uh, switch on the light. It will immediately activate and uh, yeah, you can switch off these things. So once you log out, it will go back to the same location. So, and uh, it will set the view right for you, right? So this is actually the proof of concept. So now I'm going to take you through how uh, we did this uh, work, right? So we will just take you through this here. So the concept is uh, developed as shown here. So we need a uh, BMAX, uh, graphs of BMAX you need it. And you have to develop a custom extension using the BMAX API to access the web page that is running in the ESP32 web server. So the ESP32 is able, able to connect to your Wi-Fi and uh, it is able to run a web server with uh, web pages actually, right? Then you also can uh, have uh, Arduino code uh, that can control the light. So basically the Arduino code is actually the one uh, showing the web page and also running the web server and everything, right? then uh, in turn, it will be controlling the light. So this looks very simple, but I will take you through the next few steps. So let's go through, right? So it's a complete DIY. So I know some of you are coming from architecture background or design background. You may not be uh, into this. 
on the other hand, I also see people who are very uh, interested in doing this kind of pet pack projects. So you may be interested. So we need to find a match and then we can work together to get this thing done, right? So most of the IoT devices use this uh, as a custom board and they do it. But these are the things I can get off the shelf as well. So the first equipment you need is, or first thing you need is the ESP32 dev kit board. So it has the Wi-Fi capability and Bluetooth capability, right? So it has that. And it also has need a two-channel 5-volt relay module, which uh, controls the light on and off, right? So it controls the light. To assemble this, uh, I need a breadboard. The breadboard is actually a um, connecting uh, thing, which can connect the USB 32 with other devices or power and all. So in case you make a mistake, you can always uh, disassemble and put back, right? So that's the thing. And uh, for connection, you need the jumper cables. You can see the pins here. So the pins are the one put it inside these small little holes where it can make the electrical connections. And of course you need to have the source, battery source, right? So you need to have that. And uh, as I mentioned, we are just using a three volt uh, things. So three volt path is also required, right? So let's move on to the next one. So this is actually the connection or circuit, how I did that, right? So you have this uh, ESP32 dev kit. Uh, it comes with uh, all the uh, necessary things inside there. Uh, this is actually the processor, right? So then you have this five volt uh, connection out from the board, which goes into the relay, right? So the relay module and uh, also the ground. The ground is actually the easy negative, right? So you have that. And if you see the blue color line, it is connected to the pin number 32 which sends the signal to the relay to switch on and off the light. If there is uh, high, if it is set to high, so as I shown here, right, 32, if it is set to high, the light will be on. If you set to low, the light will be off, right? So then this is the actual electrical connection. Uh, as I mentioned, I didn't touch any of our electrical connections, so I don't want to get electrocuted, so I didn't touch. So I was just using a pet project to show, right? So the ground is connected, the neutral is connected, and the line goes into the relay and uh, goes out to the bulb. So if the relay have the on signal, this connection will connect and it, the light pulse will glow, right? So that's how it works. So yeah, let me, I missed one part, is a programming part. You have to do a bit of programming. So I'm just using an Arduino IDE to do this uh, necessary coding and everything. Uh, and put it into the upload into the ESP32 board, right? So that's a part. So let me go to the next slide. You can see here, this is the Arduino interface. So you can actually uh, install the necessary uh, things for the Arduino board. So the first one is uh, we need to enable the uh, ESP32 uh, like uh, those uh, tools, right? So you need to install that. So if you go to the board manager, you need to install the board. Uh, it has an option to install it. You can select it and it can install it. Uh, in my case, it is showing installed because I already have installed, so it shows that. Uh, if you are doing it first time, you will have an option to install it. So next is uh, you need to uh, enable the board. You need to set the board for your working. So that's what I'm doing here. Under the tools, you just go in here and you can say this is the board I'm going to use, right? So you do that. Then Moving on, uh, there is a lot of examples inside this uh, Arduino uh, interface. Once you install the necessary things, uh, you have this web server, which runs inside the ESP32 development board. Uh, you can just start with this hello server, which will give you a template for you to start with. You don't need to write everything from scratch, right? So this is the code. I'm going to take you through the code snippet. Uh, if you're not a programmer, don't worry, later I have a solution for you also, is, which is off the shelf, right? So if you are a programmer, you may be interested how I did it, so I'm showing you that, right? So this is actually uh, Arduino code where you are setting the SSID and password for your Wi-Fi. So I have hidden this because of uh, privacy issues, right? So I have hidden it. And uh, if you look at here, HTTP username and HTTP password, this is again hidden here, but this is what I'm using it to log in to the web page when I switch on the light, right? So the output is the pin I'm setting here, right? So this is uh, all the settings. 
uh, currently I'm hard coding all these uh, details, but of course you can use uh, some system to set the web, uh, the login details as well. The next is the HTML code. If you look, if you know HTML, uh, you can see this is actually a typical HTML page where you have a header, body, the styles, and all those things, right? So you have all those things. Uh, but if you look at it carefully, this is the original part, right? So you are actually calling a function in next.html to create this code, right? So if Arduino sees index.html, then it will render this HTML page, right? So that's how it works. If you move, move on, so this is the second part of the HTML page where you can see all the details uh, and you can see the body, right? So you can see the logo, you can see the uh, building together image and all those things. So later I will tell you how these images will be rendered, right? So if you move on, this is the end of the function. And I'm moving on to the next slide where you can see the HTML page for uh, logout.html. So the moment I click logout, this is the page will be activated and it goes in to logout. In the logout, I have one more extra step need to do, which is actually redirecting the logout page to the Bimax, right? So how do I do that? You can see here on the body on load, when this HTML page is loaded, I want to redirect this location to a URL I'm getting it from the Bimax. So this URL Bimax application is like a, you know, you can paste it in your uh, browser and if you have Bimax, it will go into that location, right? So if you are using your mobile phone, just launch your Safari or Chrome, you paste this URL, it will take you to your Bimax file and opens that location, right? So how do I get this URL? You select the light and you go to the uh, select button. Once the light is selected, it will be highlighted in green. And you can click on the select button. You will see there is option for you to copy the hyperlink. So when you copy the hyperlink, you will have the element ID, the file name, and also the camera position and uh, the view direction. So it has the complete set where you can actually pass it to anybody and they can locate the element easily, right? So this is what I'm using here. So next part is actually the actual Arduino code. So if uh, somebody tries to connect to the web page and uh, I cannot return a web page, then there should be an error message given. That's what the first code. Then the setup starts. This is actually a communication port. This is the part where it logs into the Wi-Fi, right? So if it is not connected, it fails. So then it also prints the local IP address, which I can use it in my web access, right? So I can use it in the web access. Then finally, it goes to the part where uh, I'm using this uh, uh, library, SPIFFS. What is that? So if you see here, SPIFFS is actually serial peripheral interface flash file system. So this file system is a lightweight file system that can be uh, run inside these microcontroller controllers where you can actually upload uh, like images or resources for your web page, right? So I'm using that to keep all the images. So if you go to the next page, uh, the next part of the code uh, is actually uh, running based on the uh, HTTP request and HTTP uh, reply, right? So it's like uh, when, when somebody requests for your web page, you need to reply with the actual rendered HTML page. So the server receives a request with a slash, then it will return the first page, which is the index.html, right? It returns that. And uh, if you receive a request with the slash on, means that it need to on the light, then what it does is uh, one extra step. It says digital write output. If you remember earlier, it's actually the pin number 32. Set the output to high. When it does that, the light will be on, right? So it switches on the light and then returns okay to the user. Right. Similarly, when you go for off, it does the same. So it sets to low and clicks OK. So this is how the switch on and off is happening by the Arduino code. Right. So here you can see here on top, I have the HTML part and below is the Arduino code. So if you look at it, the logo in the HTML page, whenever the ESP32 uh, sees, the web server sees this logo, uh, it will replace that with the image from the file system. 
So the image is already loaded into the file system. So this is how it replaces. So similarly, when it sees building together, it also replaces it with the image, right? So you have to load everything into the uh, ESP32 board, then your HTML page will be rendered nicely. So once it is done, uh, it goes into log on all those things. So that's the end of the Arduino code. Once everything is done, there is no compile error or things like that. So you can actually click on the compile compile and you can upload to the ESP32 board. Uh, you can click see here number one, right? So this little arrow, if you click on it, it will compile and upload to the board. Uh, so as I mentioned, you can use the USB to connect to your ESP32 board and you can upload the content. And uh, you also can uh, place the resources like images and all those things in the sketch folder or the root folder of this program. And you can upload to the ESP32 board, right? So you can use this function for that to ESP32. This uh, IDE will help you to upload the data. So once everything is set, you can see the web page and you can control the lights with that, right? Before we go further, so we need to control it by uh, BIMAX application, right? So you have a BIM model and you put it into BIMAX. All of you may be presenting a lot of BIMAX uh, models, but there is an option for you to write uh, your own customization using the BIMAX API code. In the past sessions, we have shared how to do that. But here, I'm just taking you through a simple BIMAX uh, API uh, written. Actually, it is using JSON for uh, the thing. So you have a name. Right, so name of the uh, API or code I'm writing here, and it has the developer ID, which you can obtain from Graphisoft. Right, so I'm hiding it because this belongs to me, so I'm hiding it here. And you have a added URL, so this is the place where you can place this uh, API extension, right, and you can download it anytime. Or if you want to update it, you just put it there, it will update it automatically. And here, element context menu, right. So this is the one when you select a light and go to the context menu, you can see the function. ESP32 light is the function. And this is the URL I get from the Arduino code, right? So 192 is a local uh, thing. So I cannot access this light from outside my house. I have to be connected to my Wi-Fi, then I can access it, right? So, and this is the element ID. This is actually the actual lights ID. So once I have written this small little JSON code, uh, I can save this as ESP32.bimxx. If you see here, there is a double X, it's not mystic. This is how you have to save your file, right? So once it's saved, saved you share it to a Google Drive or any other, even by email is okay. So you can open in your mobile device where you have the uh, uh, Bimax install and you can actually download it. So I'll show you how you can do that. I'm downloading it from Google Drive, right? So I click and say open with, right? So open in and it will prepare for me. So it shows me the application. So I can choose BIMAX and it, the extension is installed, right? So that's uh, quite straightforward and simple, right? So you can do that. Okay, so that's how I did that. Just a recap on this uh, video. So I'll just show you how uh, it works now. Maybe you can understand it better after running through the code. So I'm going into BMAX again, right? So I'm just selecting the light. When I see the context menu, this is what I was talking about, right? So you can do this by the BMAX API. So again, the login part is handled by the Arduino code. So once it's logged in, right? So this is for the security reason. You don't want anybody to switch on and off your light, right? So this is a HTML part which handles the instruction Arduino part in the back end switch us on the light and off the light right so now after seeing the code you maybe understand a bit better right so you can see that that's my first part right so next is uh, off the shelf i know many of you may be telling me like uh each of them i'm not a programmer i don't do coding so what is the option i have right so is there any option for me right yes you can Right, so let me take you through a bit of extra, looks like extra stuff, but it is uh, straightforward, right? So you need BMX and you need to create a custom extension. So this time the custom, ex custom extension have to access the service from IFTTT. This is actually a service provider. So 
they can allow you to create web hooks, which gives you a URL. And this URL can be used to on off your light. One advantage of this is you can do it from anywhere. No need to be inside the house. You can do it from anywhere, right? So the IFTTT part, you can actually create the web hook that can connect to a device which is in the EV link. Most of the IoT devices uses this service, EV link, right? So they have this uh, connection. They have a mobile application which allows you to connect the IoT device like a Sonoff. So you can call it soon off or uh, yes on off, right? So uh, I'm using this uh, for this uh, prototype, right? So you can uh, use this and using the mobile application, you can connect or pair your uh, device to the router. And then later you can use the mobile applications dashboard also to control the light. So it will on and off the switch, which is provided by soon off, uh, which will turns on and off the light. Right, so this is a uh, prototype I'm going to show next. So this is the device I'm using. It is very small. Uh, it can fit into any electrical uh, things, right? So it can fit into any electrical things. It is very small actually, right? So the connection is like a you know, line in goes in, and the line out. Uh, sorry, this is the neutral. The neutral goes in and neutral goes out, and you have the line in and line out the red color, which connects to the bulb, and the neutral goes and so on, right? So in case you want to override this automation with the switch, you can use our option and you can connect the switch and uh, you can override this automation. So it also takes care of overriding the automation actually, right? So this is off the shelf thing. You can buy from Lazada or any other online uh, platform you can buy, right? So let me move on. And uh, once the device is uh, connected with a, or connected properly, Right. So you can actually pair that with this EV link setup. So it has the mobile application. Uh, you can do this quick pairing, which will pair the device to your Wi-Fi network. They are using like a 2.4G or it's, it's not a 5G, right? They are not using it. All the IoT devices I have seen, everything is using 2.4. Yeah? So they are not using the 5. And now uh, once it is paired, connected in the the, in the dashboard, you can see the light here, right? So you can add multiple devices and you can control the devices from this dashboard itself. Then you may have a question like, yeah, Chidam, why I need to do it with the BIMX then, right? So if it is a small house, you are doing a uh, area for, you know, then this is good enough. But uh, if you are doing a big area and uh, you want to control the, for the entire office or anything like what OK has shown, uh, then, of course, uh, walking through the building with BMAX and visualizing the model before selecting the light and switching on and off. So it, it gives you a very better, you know, like very good visual feedback so that you know which light you are selecting and switching on and off, right? So that's the main reason you can connect with uh, the actual device. And Rima have also shown a video from BIM AIM, so you can see how good it is to do it with the BMAX, right? So let's move on. I will show you the next part. So once it is done, then you had to use this service, IFTTT, right? So Triple T. Uh, they allow you to create small applets, use like web hooks uh, that can actually connect to the uh, EV link service. But in order to do this uh, connection, uh, I can't go with the free service or any other option. So I need to subscribe to the minimum, uh, like a 9.9 .9 per year. So once I have done, I have this, uh, these are the you know, number of homes is good enough for me and the number of rooms and all those things. So if you want more, of course you can go for pro. So for IFTTT, I'm at the moment using only uh, the free version, which can run three applets. But if you want to have more, of course, they also have uh, options, right? So let me show you a uh, little video, okay? So how I did that. So I'm using the same mobile device. So I can search for uh, what I want to connect with. So the web hooks, right? So once I get a web hook, I just move on a bit. Okay. So I enter the device name. Right. So once I connected, uh, if I receive that even name, then I search for the EV link devices in my mobile app. Right, so when I type in, I have this uh, e-billing option. 
so I can search for a single channel switch, right? So when I select it, it will look for the device and load all the devices from EVLink. So I can see the edge light, right? So then now it is connected, right? So if I receive a, a event or edge light, it will connect to the EVLink device and switches on the light, right? So that's so simple. You don't need to do any coding in that sense, right? So moving on, how do I get the URL? So this is actually the web address for my device. So this event part, I need to replace with uh, uh, the actual event, like hash like for example, right? So and every user will get their unique key. This is very important. So I'm hiding it here because that's my key. Later you can control my life, right? So I don't want that to happen. So I'll just keep it this way. Uh, you have this URL for everything. So for on, you have one URL. For off, you have one URL. But in case you want to use the same URL, you also can pass uh, parameters like value one, value two. Uh, so you can use a single URL for both actually, right? So that next step is very straightforward. You write uh, BMAX API. Uh, this is again using JSON, right? So you have the developer ID URL and you put the context menu, H type on, H type off. So, and you pass the events, right? So, and also the key and everything. So, this is the URL. So, once it is done, save it as uh, BMX X and install in your device. So, now you will have a context menu which can control the light on and off. So, you don't need to do a lot of coding. You can still connect any IoT device to the BMX app, right? So, you can do that. Okay, so I have come to the end of my presentation. Hope you like it. So I will pass it to Vimal, my next speaker, to take you through BMX for hard desking. Vimal? Yeah, thank you, Chidam. All right, so uh, thank you, Chidam, for passing it on to me. Um, so the topic today I'm going to present is BMX for hard desking. So before going into the technical details of this presentation, let me explain the background of it. So here we are going to do the reservation for hot desking using the BMX user interface and also using the BMX API, which will open a web page from where we will do the reservation. And of course, for having the BMX hyper model, we need to have the ARCHICAD model first. So for that, we need to uh, scan. We are going to use the 3D scanner technology here and then scan the facility and then uh, import the scan data inside ARCHICAD to create the uh, ARCHICAD model. And from there, we need to extract the required information to do the hot desking, that is the reservation for hot desking, and use Google Sheets as the database. Okay, so we'll uh, put the seating data here. Say, for example, since we are doing hot desking, we just need the seating data. So the seating data of the ARCHICAD model will be uh, exported and imported inside the Google Sheets. So whenever the user uh, uses the BIMAX, API, uh, BIMAX user interface to do the reservation, that data will also directly go into the Google Sheets to the corresponding seat number or the GUID of the seat. All right, after uh, the reservation is done, we are also going to visualize the current statuses of the uh, seats, the occupancy statuses of the seats in ARCHICAD uh, using the Rhino Grasshopper scripts. Okay, and also we are going to use graphic overrides to visually show the statuses whether it is occupied or it is free at any given point in time. All right, so this is the background. Let me go ahead. So as I told earlier, we are going to use the scan to BIM technology, which is basically a 3D LiDAR scanner technology, which, which we are going to use to scan the facility and then convert that data into uh, 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 an appropriate format and import it inside the ARCHICAD and then uh, use that as a reference to draw the ARCHICAD BIM model. All right, so we are going to use the scan technology. And then the other is hot desking, which is an efficient way of using the workspace by different people at different time on an ad hoc basis. So for example, if there is a limited space, but there are people using this same space at different times, that is on the scattered schedule, then we can use the hot desking system uh, especially during this COVID situations, government authorities are requesting people to work at scattered timelines. So we can use hot desking with a limited workspace to achieve that. All right. So as I told earlier, uh, scan to BIM, we have three options. The first option is to use the iPhone or the iPad latest ones. The current iPhone 12 uh, Pro and then 12 Pro Max are having the 3D LiDAR scanner in it. So we can have a third party um, 
mobile applications on the app app store and then use that to scan the facility and then from there we can export to multiple other uh, formats which can be used inside archicad and the second option is to uh, develop a do uh, do it yourself lidar scanner just like what uh, mr chidam did in the previous presentation for the light control we can develop our own arduino based lidar scanners and on the third option would be the professional 3d lidar scanner uh, which is available on the market this is a bit more costlier than the previous options but the efficiency of the data or the accuracy of the data will be much higher than the previous options but of course for uh, for our uh, usage for this demo uh, we have used iphone for scanning the facility and then uh, bringing the xyz data into archicad to develop the bim model all right so the cost of this do it yourself lidar scanner would be around like uh, 100 to 200 sing dollars whereas the professional 3d scanners would be a bit costlier like uh, more than 1000 sing dollars all right so as i told earlier we are using uh, iphone 12 pro for this demo so let me go through the uh, system architecture of this uh, bimx for hot desking the first step is to scan the space so we have scanned the space using the iphone 12 pro using the app uh, on the app uh, there are multiple apps, apps available on the app store we can use any one of them and uh, once we scan we need to export it to xyz fam format from the uh, app and then you can import it inside archicad and do the post processing here post processing in the sense uh, we need to you know put them or arrange them into a particular location and then start modeling so after that we need to do the modeling and then um, after modeling inside archicad we need to export the required information that is the seating information in this system uh, using the python script uh, the Python API has been shared in the previous uh, computational BIM webinar for digital construction. So you guys can please watch it if you want to export information from Archicad and put it inside the Google Sheets. So as I told, uh, we are just uh, exporting the um, seat related information that is the GUID of the seat and then the uh, seat ID of uh, the seats. All right. And put it inside the Google Sheets. All right. So once we do that, uh, the database is ready. Then we can uh, use BIMX user interface uh, and then BIMX API to open a web page from where the user will do the reservation. So the user will uh, enter the date and time of the uh, reservation that they want, and then that information will be directly put inside the Google Sheets. Okay. So once the Google Sheet is updated, we need to update the Archicad model in real time with the current statuses. So for that, as I told earlier, we are using um, Rhino Grasshopper script for that. And finally, uh, we also can visualize the statuses in BIMX uh, at any user defined time. And of course, it is not in real time, but if you see Archicad model, it will be updated in real time from the Google Sheets using Rhino Grasshopper, but this uh, BIMX visualization is not real time. So user can define any time and then you can find out the statuses of the occupancy of the seats at that particular point of time. Okay. All right. So let me do a demo. Um, all right. Let me first explain the screens that are available here. This is my mobile screen, the leftmost one. And the middle one is my Google Sheets. And this is the uh, Archicad, which is showing the statuses of the sheets. So currently everything is in green color, which means it is uh, free. So if I do any uh, reservation, it will change it to uh, red immediately. All right, so let me go to my BIMX screen that is on my mobile screen, which I'm using right now. So I'm going inside the GSSG office. So this is uh, our Graphisoft Singapore office. If you guys have ever visited our office, so you will be able to recognize it. All right, we have all the seats inside, model perfectly. So now I need to check the uh, hot desking seat availability. So for that, I'm just clicking the top ellipsis icon, and then uh, I can click the check hot desking availability option, which is which is uh, available because of the BIMX API. So when I click that, I'm able to see a web page opening where I can choose the date and time that, for which I want to do the reservation okay so uh, say for example uh, let me just have it a current time and then the, the by default it will have a 30 minutes of uh, 30 minutes later with the end time okay so and then i'm clicking check availability so when i check 
do the check availability everything is in cyan color so which means it is all free now so let me zoom inside and then do a reservation so for that i need to select the particular seat and then go to the element context menu and you'll be able to see the reserve seat option which is available because of the bimx api bimx extension all right so it will open a web page and ask me to uh, click allow which is uh, like logging in so this is uh, in this system we are using google uh, account for logging into the uh, system to do the reservation because it's like controlling the access because every anybody having the system uh, will not be allowed to do the uh, reservation so they must log in they must have proper access to it only then they'll be able to uh, reserve the seats okay so after that i'm clicking reserve seats and then seat reserved so if you see here on the google sheet it automatically changed to occupied and also in the uh, bimx api the particular seat that uh, bimx user interface the particular seat that i reserved got red in color okay all right if you see here in uh, archicad model it automatically changed in real time to red in color you can see okay so if i want to do another reservation i just so here if you see inside the selector you can see the list of seats based on their ids so the one is reserved all the other are free okay so say for example if i want to do another reservation just check hot desk in availability and then if i check the availability you can see that that particular seat is already occupied okay so now i try to uh, reserve another seat and then click allow so after clicking reserved you can see it got occupied here on the google sheets and then inside the uh, auto uh, archicad it will auto also get updated in real time okay so if you see here in the sheets there is another sheet which is the future sheet uh, which i'll show you a bit later this will have the reservation data okay so with this we are done with the demo let me go back to my presentation all right coming back to the system architecture uh, i'm going to explain the each and every step uh, in detail so that anyone watching this video should be able to create their own system based on the information that is shown here okay so sorry if uh, if it goes a bit more technical uh, yeah so the first step as i told is scan the space so we have used the 3d scan app that is available on the app store to scan and then get the information in uh, xyz format and if you see here this is uh, the lobby of our office uh, so we have uh, scanned the lobby, uh, entrance of our office and you can see the point cloud data here and if you scan this qr code you'll be able to download this app and you can also scan if you have uh, iphone 12 pro or the latest um, ipads okay so the next step is post processing once we export the xyz format we need to bring it inside archicad so when we bring it inside archicad you have to go to file interoperability import point clouds okay so in the format conversion uh, only once you click import point clouds the user will be prompted to select the xyz data from your computer so once you select the data uh, you will see the format uh, format conversion dialog box here so in the format conversion dialog box you will have several options but before that let me explain you something when we bring in the xyz data that is the point cloud data inside archicad we found out that the y and z coordinates are flipped or mirrored so for that we need to go to go to the object and then open its gdl script and then do the uh, mirroring in y and z uh, coordinates but there is another way we can use this options here uh, we can flip number three and number two here so i am setting y coordinates to number three and then z coordinates to number two yeah, which means i'm like swapping y and z coordinates which is basically mirroring okay and then click okay so once you click okay the user will be uh, seeing create point clouds object so you can see here the xyz data that we have uh, uh, chosen will be changed to an object so here it will be changed to an object and then that object will be placed inside the lcf file which is the library container file okay so and after that is converted we can create and place this inside the archicad model so once when we place this 
it will look something like this so you need to this is all the point cloud data that we have scanned using the iphone all right so this point cloud data each and every point in this point cloud data is snappable so you can snap to the corners of the room and start modeling your walls by using this point cloud data as the reference okay so once the model is created we can use uh, graphic overrides to show the statuses so uh, we can set all that before exporting it to the google sheets and again uh, populate uh, populating the or database with the necessary information you can watch the previous webinar uh, using the python script let me go to the google sheets data and show you what are the information that is available there so if you see here the gray colored uh, cells on the current worksheet all right so this is the current worksheet which shows the occupancy status of the current uh, at, at any given point in time okay so this is the the gray color uh, cells or from archicad using the python script and this occupancy status of seats are automatically managed using the google scripts okay which is hosted within the google sheets i'll show those later but first let me explain the uh, data structure of my google sheets so second is the future seats here all the information that the user enters during the reservation will be coming here so the guid of the seat so let me just show point yeah so the guid of the seat and then the start time that the user enters and the end time that the user enters will be entered here okay so whenever that start time arrives um the uh, google script will have a code that is running every minute will check for the start time and if that particular seat comes then the occupancy of that seat will get occupied okay all right so when the end time arrives the same code will uh, identify the end time and then uh, it will uh, change the status to free for the occupancy of that particular seat so it is all managed automatically in the background using the google scripts that is hosted within the google sheet all right so when the end time arrives that particular data will be removed from this future table and then put it inside the past table and this past table will contain the past one month data so if any data goes beyond one month it will automatically be deleted using the same google scripts which runs automatically using the triggers so let me go to the next slide so you can see here this is the google scripts that is hosted within the google sheets and you can see it will check for the start and end time and once when the start time arrives it will change the occupancy of that particular seat to occupied okay so the this is just a code snippet of uh, changing the status to occupy the similar code uh, set snippet will be there to change the status to free back and then from for removing the statuses uh, removing the uh, entries from future and putting it inside the uh, past and then also from deleting it from the past okay so this is how the google sheet works all right now that the database is fully populated with the necessary information we can uh, use bimx api to uh, do the reservation all right let me show the bimx api for that again as uh, mr chidam was showing in the previous presentation it's a json file format having key and value data here so you can see here i was using two different uh, options inside my bimx one is to check the hot desking availability that is available on the project info here you can see and the other option is to uh, do the reservation of the seat which is available on the element context menu of the seats okay so the check hot desking availability will open this url and uh, uh, element context menu will open this next url which will pass the element id of the seat along with it okay so this is how bimx api works and you need to install this bimxx file inside your uh, mobile phone to have these options inside bimx to do the reservation let me go back to the system architecture so now that we have done uh, we have done with the bimx api we need to check the web app and how to set up the web application that is the web pages that is doing the reservation uh, for this hot desking so here uh, again it is a html page uh, we will have javascript inside that mm, uh, you can see here uh, i mean i'm checking the uh, that we can set multiple criteria uh, to restrict the users to do the reservation say for example here i'm restricting the user to do the reservation from 8:30 uh, and and before 6:30 pm 6 pm sorry so if the user goes beyond that time you can restrict the user from doing the reservation similarly we can set multiple criteria depending on our particular need 
okay so the next step once the uh, user enters the required time and data of the reservation based on the criteria we set um, this particular data has to be communicated and entered inside the google sheets in the future uh, table as i showed there so for that we are using google sheets api and then the google sheets api um, will be handled using uh, google console project so the same google console project will uh, let the users to log into the project um, like uh, you know controlling the access for the people so uh, as i was showing there i was using the google uh, my google accounts to do the reservation so the same thing is also controlled by google console project okay so coming back to this uh, snippet of code um, i need to enter the guid of the component inside my spreadsheet so i have hidden the spreadsheet id for privacy reasons so i'm entering the value inside the future table in the last row of it okay so the information that i enter is guid and then the start and the end time okay so once when the uh, data is put inside the google sheets the user will get a notification that the seat is reserved inside your bimx okay so this is how this is managed and you can scan this qr code and find out the examples on how to let your html page communicate with your google sheets using the uh, uh, console project google console project so this is the google console project where i can get the client id and then the api key here which need to be entered here inside your google code, uh, inside your html code to let your code communicate with the google sheets all right so here there is an example um, uh, of how to create uh, the google sheets in a video in youtube video and you can uh, watch it and set up your own google console project and then let your html page communicate with your google sheets all right so now that the google sheets is uh, updated with the reservation data we need to update that back to our rtcad all right so for that as i told earlier we are using rhino grasshopper script for that so let me go to that and rhino uh, grasshopper is a node based platform where we can interlink multiple uh, nodes and perform a specific task so again here we need to get access to the uh google sheets and read the data from there and then enter the data inside archicad model so for that i'll just explain the key nodes here that i'm using again these are all python script nodes uh, available inside uh, grasshopper so we need to uh, you know create the python script node and enter the code inside to perform that specific task all right so let me explain one by one the first one is to get access to the particular google sheets that we have okay so for that again you need to have a google console project just the one which i showed earlier so similar to this we need to have one more google console project that will let your grasshopper script uh, read data from google sheets and then enter it inside archicad okay so yeah for that we need to have the client id which i showed earlier in the form of json and then uh, use that value here and uh, um, and again i'm using the google sheets api here uh, which is the version 4 of it and if you scan the qr code here you will get the libraries of google sheets um, and you will also have manual there which has all the documentation on how to set up the project inside your grass uh, uh, grasshopper or inside any particular uh, desktop application and you can use this uh, library to communicate with google sheets and get the data from there okay so this particular code will get the access to my google sheets okay so the uh, after getting access i need to get uh, i need to read the google sheet data okay for that i am going to this uh, node but before that let me explain the sheet id here so this is the sheet id that i am going to um, read the data from and then if you see uh, i am reading the data from the current sheet all right so this particular node will be tr triggered every once again meaning so this node will read my google sheet every once again and get the data from there so this is triggered by a timer connected with that uh, node so going inside the code of that node uh, again i'm using the google sheets api version 4 to read the data from the sheet at every once again so if i read that i will get the data in an array format and then it is passing it to the next node where it will get filtered okay so if you see the next node the data that is coming from the previous node will be uh, uh, you know gone through one by one and if there is any change in the uh, 
theta which uh, occupancy of the seat it will refer it to the previous theta and then check if there is any change if there is any change it will pass it to the next uh, node if there is no change it will be null okay you can see it is that the, the, since there is no change at that particular point in time it shows null okay so here is the where it's it uh, sends the guid of the seat and then the statuses of the seat to the next uh, node so inside the next node we are using a json api you can scan the qr code here which will take you to the uh, json api of archicad using which we can update the statuses of uh, uh, archicad components from the grasshopper script okay so here this json api if you see here we have a, a hot desking parameter that is create property that is created inside all the seats and uh, we are updating the statuses of that uh, hot desking property okay uh, that we read from the google sheets okay so this is how it works and finally once the archicad model is updated using the uh, uh, the graphic overrides we will be able to visually see the statuses of the uh, occupancy of the seats uh, and then after we can also visualize the status inside uh, bimx so let me show that so yeah so visually we can check uh, whether the seat is uh, reserved or whether it is empty and in this list format also we can get to see the seat ids that is reserved and that is free all right so let me show the potential use cases here um, so as we all saw the hot desking is one uh, use case and we can also uh, uh, reserve the facilities or rooms something like uh, meeting rooms dining halls we can we can uh, use bimx to book all those and then uh, we can also use the uh, bimx api for uh, visualizing the repair and maintenance statuses of components inside bimx and we can automate those visualization from any database not just the google sheets you can use any database and from there we can read the data and then automate the visualization using the api all right and then uh, visualization of scope of work this is like uh, when there is a um uh, facility manager assigning some task to a facility engineer under him he can assign it inside bimx so whenever the facility engineer checks his uh, scope of work he'll be able to uh, see it based on the color code that is predefined and also we can add information inside the element info of the elements inside bimx using the bimx api so all that is possible so these are some of the use cases apart from what is shown by Rima and mr chidam in the previous presentations all right with this we have come to the end of this presentation so next will be our 15 minutes break so we'll see you guys at 5 10 uh, after which mr uh, carlo and ralph will be presenting an interesting uh, presentation thank you okay so yeah my name is carlo so my topic is all about um, digital uh, twin updating beam model dynamically so this is the last session uh, for the computational beam so, uh, yep, let me share with you the, the previous session. Um, okay, the first one we did is the computational beam for documentation. Then we did the computational beam for manufacturing. Then computational beam for digital construction. Then this is the last part. Okay, so let's move on to the main topic, which is the digital uh, updating, uh, digital twin updating beam model dynamically. So what is digital twin? Basically, uh, Rima already discussed this uh, in earlier slides. So uh, this is a simple term is digital mockup or plus the physical environment, something like that. Okay, so we will we will try to use the data in the uh, digital twin and then use it for um, uh, manipulating the 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 as built model we have. Okay, so the solution one we have here is. Uh, to use a camera to track changes on the actual layout and then update the layout in Archicad as built uh, BIM model using uh, computer vision and object detection. Okay, so that's the plan. So we have another solution, which is uh, if you're not really a programmer, of course, you can have uh, a ready to use solution. We have MWI, so Metropolitan Wireless International here to provide solution for indoor uh, positioning system. We will explain a bit more details on this but first um, let me show you what's the plan so basically uh, this is a very very simple workflow we only need to get the actual position or the actual coordinates of the object just an example a chair 
So we need the actual position of it. So how can we achieve this? So basically by using computer vision object detection. Okay, so I'll just give you um, a little bit uh, of explanation what is object detection. So this is a computer technology related uh, to computer vision and image processing that detects instances semantic object. I know it's a bit uh, heavy, but it's like uh, you know detecting cars, peoples, and buildings, and so on. So how the object detection works? Basically, this is a simple diagram show uh, how uh, object detection works. Just a disclaimer: I'm not really expert on this field, so I might say something up. So just just uh, bear with me. So semantic segmentation is the process of uh, you know, linking each pixel in an image to class. So basically, um, um, we are ident identifying the pixel, and then uh, we're, we're like putting classification, as you can see here in in the image. Then once we have this classification, then that is the time we run the learning, means uh, like you know machine learning and so on. Okay, so what are the uses of um, object detection? So again, this is a very common uh, object detection is uh, like uh, here for quite some time already. So this is not a new technology. So they use it for self-driving cars, Tesla is using it and so on. So to detect um, like people crossing, pedestrian, uh, car signs, and then the distance between the car to car, something like that. Okay, so it's been around for a uh, long time. Then uh, in manufacturing as well, so they use this for uh, quality check, like visual checking, inventory management, and so on. Okay, the, this is the most common use of object detection, so like people counting crowd uh, statistics and pace detection. Okay, it's so in construction as well. So I uh, some of the advanced uh, construction firm, they use this uh, um, object detection as well, as you can see on your um upper right corner right they use a handphone to detect whether someone is using a helmet or the best and so on so it's for safety and uh this is very popular robot is spot from i think uh, boston dynamics so they use this uh for beam robotics so again the 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 technology they use is uh object detection as well yep so how about uh, facility management or beam facility management Again, we're not expert in facility management, but um, yeah, I will share some idea about how we could how we could use um, object detection in facility management. Yep. Okay. So in real world application, so we have this current problem now, right? The, the new normal. Okay, which is the COVID impact to existing building layout. So actually, COVID is not only affecting people, uh, but also the building structure, or building design layout as well. Yep, uh, the reason why, because of the social distancing. Okay, I, as you can see here, um, the landscape or the building layout has been changed. Uh, now this wonderful staircase became like a pull up mask and tape. Then, you know, the dining areas has been changed because of the one meter uh, requirements. And even the cinemas and auditorium as well. As you can see, um, there's a lot of changes because of this uh, COVID. So this is where we actually come up with the idea. So we need to really rethink, redesign to adapt with the changes. I mean, at least to comply with the new normal requirements, right? So that's why we come up with this idea and hopefully this will spark your imagination. So again, what we are presenting here is just a proof of concept. Okay, so basically, pure uh, proof of concept. So we're just uh, giving you ideas so that you, it keeps you, um, I mean, it sparks your idea to create something, right? Using object detection. So again, basically this is a very simple requirements. Uh, we need the actual coordinates. So we will be using camera for this one. So basically this is the plan. As you can see, this is our office. This is a new layout. You notice some of the chairs are missing already because of the one meter uh, social distancing uh, social distancing requirements. As as my as built layout is still the same, so I'll be updating this one uh, real time. Okay, so this is a software that we're gonna use. Of course, we're gonna use Python and some of the libraries um, inside Python, which is OpenCV, uh, MediaPipe, um, Matplot, uh, Plotlib for visualization. Then um, we're going to use Google Sheets and then, of course, our solution, which is ArchiCAD. And then we're going to use Rhino Grasshopper. Okay. 
Yep. So uh, we did a testing in our office. So basically, this is just a testing to check the accuracy and so on. But apparently, we do have one camera only. I'm using a webcam. So as you can see here, um, there's a little bit of discrepancy. But what we need here is actually the the coordinates. So means the center position of the object. So we did we did run a few testing and check whether this one uh, will be. Uh, I mean, we, can we get the accurate data and so on? So basically, what we need here, as you can see, uh, it gives me a report of the movement of the object. You can see that there is a staggered thing. Actually, we don't need it. Uh, we need the end position. Means I only need the the original position and then where it ends. So something here. Okay. So that's the only uh, data I need. So how much it moves. Okay. So now, um, just to share with you about the accuracy, if I'm using this normal webcam camera with a very low uh, resolution, which is 720p, it matters in, in, in object detection, okay? So, but if you uh, want to really explore and invest, okay, I suggest uh, you use the stereo cam. Uh, this one is suggested by our friend from the coding library, Nick. Uh, it's better to use the stereo camera, but the the, configuration will be different. The algorithm will be very, very complicated. Okay, if you want to really get the accuracy, you can also use slider camera and sensor as well. Okay, but for now, this is just a proof of concept. I use my normal webcam camera for this exercise. Okay, this is a demo. Okay, so this is the plan. So once I move this chair, it gives me the chair trajectory. So what it does actually, this is the coordinate, but in pixel. So it gives me the X coordinate uh, and the Y coordinate, but in pixel. So we need to do some um, um, conversion. So make sure you know your resolution first. For example, I'm using a 720p. So I need to convert that uh, pixel to centimeter or millimeter, it's up to you. Then we need to get the actual measurement. Actual measurement, actually, we, we could get it in our as-built model given we have already have one. So once we have converted the pixel to uh, centimeter or uh, millimeters, then we need to automate and pass it to Google Sheets. So let me share you the Archicad and um, Grasshopper part. So on your lower uh, left, this is the Google Sheet. So once it's automate and pass the value to Google Sheets, okay, just hold on for a while. So once you see the values in the Google Sheets, What's going to happen here is uh, it will um, create a new uh, object in Archicad and then um, change the renovation filter to new. So I will explain what this renovation filter. So as you can see here, right, the, the red one is the new position of the, the chair based on the object detection. Okay, then the, the, the existing one is on the, on the right side. So we can use renovation filter to hide the existing one and just show the the new um, object. So for those who are not Archicad user, um, here in Archicad, we call it renovation filter. So this is to assign uh, like a property to an object to specify if this one is existing, new one, or to be demolished. I think it's very similar to Revit. Uh, they use spacing, I think. So yeah, we call it renovation filter. Okay, so how it works. So basically, you need to import the libraries, as I mentioned. You need to import uh, OpenCV, MediaPipe, uh, Time, this is a common one, and Matplotlib. Then again, uh, with the help of our friend Nick, uh, so we actually helped me a lot on the, the coding because uh, we are really not expert on this build, especially in object detection. So, But some of the codes, actually, you can get it from MediaPipe as well. So what happened here, uh, let me explain it to you. So uh, we need to convert the, once we run the camera, right? So we need to convert the BGR image to RGB. Then after that, uh, we need to pass this RGB image to Objectron. So this Objectron actually is a Google base, uh, Google database the, that process image. So basically uh, the process uh, image pass through image, something like that. So once you have a chair, then it goes to Google uh, database and check if this one is a chair, something like that. So it's like image to image. So, yep, so this is object run. Then after that, we need to convert back the color for OpenCV, okay, and use it later. 
then uh, this is the the interesting part so once the the computer identified that this is a chair we can now uh, we could now put some boundaries or we call it bounding box so so what it does actually the first part here uh, it creates a 2d landmark so it's like the xy of the of the object then after that from the xy it creates a bounding box so from here we can get the coordinates already okay so again on the google sheet side so i think bimal already explained this one in detail but for those who don't know so there's an initial setup that you need to do so the first thing is of course you need to uh, go to google console and then um, create a project enable uh, google drive api and google sheet as well then you need to create a credential later i'll explain why you need the credential then uh, I think Bimal already explained why we need the credentials. So we need this one in our Python script in Grasshopper. And then download the JSON file. Okay. So just scan the, scan the QR code and, and you will see some of the sample script. Or just watch the previous computational beam we have in, the, in the session three. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Google Sheets uh, snippets there. Okay. So, yep. So back now to our solution to our solution which is archicad then actually here here in archicad we have connection to rhino grasshopper right so what i have here actually is a very very basic uh script in grasshopper nothing really uh complicated here so what happened we we get the object right so this is the object then now we deconstruct so it means we extract some of the information inside that object and get its coordinates so what uh, I mean by coordinates, so we already have the as built plan, right? So once we have the as built plan, we can get the coordinates using deconstruct. Okay, so once I have this x, y, z, then uh, the next step, of course, is just add that coordinates, new coordinates. Okay, so down here, this is just a settings, just an example. I want to check what is the ID, and then I can reuse some of the the properties, you know, like layers and so on, and pass it to the new object. Okay, the new position of the object. So again, this one Bimal already discussed in very detailed uh, manner. So what we're gonna do here is actually get the the movement of the object. So as I mentioned, it's position, not really coordinate. So so what I mean is how much the object moves. For example, uh, in the video, right? So I move the chair like 800 mm. So after that, it transferred the data to Google Sheets then this one will automatically get the data and then pass it to my to my uh, new newly created object so as you can see here just an example it moves by 1.5 as an example in the x coordinates i will just need to add this one to my existing coordinates okay so again um, if the object moves in the x x coordinate by 1.5 i just need to add this one to my existing coordinate x okay so this is how it works. It's very simple. But again, as I mentioned, after that, what we did is apply some renovation uh, status or filter. Okay, uh, in for those Archicad user, um, if you click the object and go to the settings, you will see this renovation. Okay, so um, now most of the object is now existing because this is as built. So what I'm gonna do here is um, change the renovation filter to new. Okay, um, maybe you're asking why this one is two, because uh, it, it uh, the computer reads this one by index. That's an example. Existing is zero, and then uh, to be demolished is one, and then new is two. That's why my value here is two. And after that, I'm gonna pass the settings to the new object. Okay, yeah, that is for the um, the first solution. It's very straightforward so we use object detection and then use rhino grasshopper to create an object okay so let's move on to the uh, second solution so if you are really not a programmer so again as i mentioned we have a ready to use solution by metropolitan uh, wireless international so basically we will be using uh, tracking devices so means we will put some devices on the furniture Okay, so be before that, I will ask Rod to introduce uh, what the company does and uh, give you some introduction. Then after that, I'm gonna uh, continue on the technical part. Rod? Okay, hello. Uh, yep, so 
For the next presentation, we will be uh, using the indoor positioning system technology. So it works uh, completely different with the uh, outdoor location, which is the GPS, which has uh, available libraries out there. So we have uh, searched for um, a collaborator here in Singapore, and there we found MWI. Okay, so they have a good track record, very good track record with uh, these kind of solutions. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so their company works on several solutions for different industry needs, such as uh, locating people or, and, or assets, uh, the same as what uh, Jorge has uh, mentioned earlier. So the same as that uh, building from Deloitte. Deloitte. Uh, keeping employees safe. So they also have some uh, for improving operations efficiency, voice and text communication, and also uh, space management. Uh, and their customers are including entities from the government, public safety, and those in the transport sector. Okay, next slide, please. So to learn more um, about them and their products, uh, you can find more information in their website. Uh, also, you can scan the QR code. So they have a very good use case uh, in their website, uh, how they implemented in, in one of the uh, major um, sites here in Singapore. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ralph, for the introduction. So again, uh, back to the technical part. So basically, we, we collaborate with them. It, so it, it goes back to the same principle, means uh, we need the actual coordinates, but this time we're going to use uh, tracking devices. In the previous solution, uh, we use camera, right? But this time, we're going to use uh, tracking devices installed to the object or furniture. Okay, so it, it's, it works the same. So I'll be using the same Google Sheets. I'll be using the same script in Grasshopper. Okay, so again, as I mentioned, we will be using uh, indoor tracking device uh, by Metropolitan Wireless International. Okay, so this is how it works. So this is just again as a proof of concept. Uh, so let me explain this one on the on the left side. This is the actual uh, camera and. Uh, on the right side is the viewer or the browser viewer here. Okay, you can easily uh, track uh, in plan view. Uh, actually, in your um, uh, right side is a plan view, and then the left side is the real one. Okay, so uh, the tag number one, as you can see, right, there's a tag number one card uh, two, actually is located at the back. So we will just pretend that this one is the chair. Okay. And then the tag number two is the wristband. It's another uh, 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 tagging here. Okay, so this one I'll explain why we need two later. Okay, then after that, you see the pole at the middle. This is the tracker. Okay, so means uh, we need the tracker, uh, not necessarily on the middle, but there's a radius on it. Okay, so let me show you this one. Again, this is just a proof of concept. Okay, so just to take note, that this two is the the tag and this is the tracker okay a good friend of uh, us william will just move the chair just an example as you can see it tracks the object real time okay as you can see he actually rotated a little bit and now you see the position right okay so it means the chair has been uh, rotated a little bit now once we have this data we need to sync this one to our Google Sheet. So we we are using one Google Sheets here. So once the object moves, then it pass the data or coordinates here in Google Sheets. So again, uh, back to the uh, workflow, which which is uh, Google Sheets to Rhino Grasshopper. Yep, as you can see here, uh, let me play this one. Okay, so once we have the position, then let's wait for uh, Google Sheet to update. So once we have the value, for example, uh, column A is the X, column B is the Y. You can see, right, this is now the new position of the object. So every time uh, William moves the, the chair with the tracker, Google Sheet will be updated, and then our 3D model will be updated as well. 
again, uh, this uh, shows the existing location and the new location. We can always use the renovation filters in Articad uh, saying, for example, I only want to see the new location. I don't want to see the existing position. Okay, so, yep, so how it works. So basically, uh, they put two trackers. One, the first tracker, the red one, is the um, location. So it gives me the X, Y. Okay, then after that, we will pass this value to Google Sheets, and then uh, we will get it from uh, uh, Google Sheets. So again, this is the same uh, workflow. It's a very simple, but uh, very useful. So it means we will extract again the existing coordinates, and then we need to add up. The, the the movement of the new object or new position. As an example, it moves two meters. So we need to get this value and then pass it back to the uh, Archicad, okay? So as I mentioned, uh, here in Archicad, we have this renovation filter. Okay, and then for the rotation angle. So again, we will get all the values from the Google Sheets, from the tracker. Then we will pass the value to the vector X, Y, Z. Then after that, we will connect this one to the vector uh, two points. Then once we have this vector two points, we, we could now calculate the angle using the vector angle. Okay, then after that, we're going to pass this one, uh, I mean pass the value to object set uh, existing in Archicad using the angle. Okay. Okay, so yep, I think that's it. So I would like to thank um, Metropolitan Wireless uh, International and of course our friend Nick. So just scan this one if you want to learn more about object detection and then please scan the indoor positioning uh, for Metropolitan if you want to learn more about the devices. Okay, yep, thank you.